This morning, our scripture reading will be 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10 in the NIV version. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Thank you, Tanner. Good morning, Mason Church. How are we doing this morning? Awesome, awesome. It's good to see each and every one of you. God is good. And all the time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you're here visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that you are our, our you are special, you're special to me, you're special to us, and we thank you for being here uh, on this morning. If you are in our audience via live stream, and this is your first time with us or your 30th time with us, thank you for being here uh, with us as well. We, we, here at the Mesa Church, we love people who love God, and we love visiting people who love God. And so we ask that you give us an opportunity after this, whether you are, uh, if you're online, just type your name in there so that I'll know who you are and I'd love to visit with you. If you're here in person, there's a card in the back of the pew. Uh, please fill that out. I would love to visit with you uh, uh, this upcoming, uh, this upcoming uh, week. Um, so we began a new series today. And this is, um, a very interesting series because we don't necessarily ever talk about sin. And that's something that is, is common to humanity, and yet somehow in church we don't necessarily talk about it. Um, and, and this morning I want you to realize and I want you to know that if you're here and you live a perfected life, you are my role model. And I want to be just like you when I grow up. But for, the, for the, maybe the 50 of us who know where we've been, we know what our struggles are, we know who, no, nah, I'm just teasing. For all of us in here, we know where we've been. We know what our struggles are. And sometimes we, we make sin out to be uh, the thing that, oh, well, I got to, you know, it, sin is sin. And the standard of God is that sin is what separated us from God. Sin is something that humanity deals with, has dealt with, will continue to deal with. You not the first and you definitely won't be the last. But we have, we have to understand that sometimes we take the, the, the progressive approach and we say, well, you know, I, I sinned, but there is grace. And you're absolutely right. And then we take the other approach where we say, I've sinned and yet, you know, oh, you know, now I better make sure that I'm, I'm good with God. And you're absolutely correct. But I think there's a, there, is a, there is a word from the word today. And the word from the word for the next couple of weeks. And so this is not just a one-off thing. You'll be hearing this probably the next six weeks or so. But my goal is this to, uh, today is to get us started, to, to get us on the runway. We're not going to take off. We're just going to get started. And so life. Anybody ever live life? Live in life right now? Let me tell you, life is hard. It really is. Life is hard. Life is difficult, but life is great. When you have God, life is hard. Life is difficult, but it's great because you're not living life alone. Today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let me tell you, stop living life by yourself because the struggle is already a struggle, but you don't have to do it by yourself because our struggle has already been remedied by, by God. He's already taken care of this. And so why not live with God and things be peaceful, then live without God, things be a struggle and chaotic. So here it is, 1 John chapter 1. Paul, uh, not Paul, but John. John is dealing with the uh, di uh, diastasism. And he is pushing back at false teachers. 
and he is sharing with them that, yes, I understand what you think. Yes, I understand what you believe. But John says there's a problem with what you believe. And so I believe what is good for us is it's good for us to start with sin. What is it? Let me tell you, it's very simple, and we're not going to overcomplicate it. Sin is missing the mark of the high calling. That's sin. Anytime that you are outside of the, the, the mark of God, the standard of God, the purpose of God, anytime you are outside of that, you are in sin. And one of the devastating effects of being a sinner is that you are in a state of sin, which means that you are opposite of the purpose of God. That's being the, that is the state of being a sinner. You are the opposite of the purposes of God. Now, one of the things that I think that Satan really loves to do is he loves to make topics like this taboo so that we can be, so that we uh, can be ignorant to what it is. Sin is when we have been separated from God and we are in need of God to be merciful to us because of this separation that has occurred. But what we need to realize is that as children of God, Jesus has paid the price for sin. Jesus has taken care of sin, but just because he's taken care of sin does not mean that you will not sin. It just means that when you sin, you have an opportunity to still be good with God because Jesus died for the sin that was committed. So think about this. I need us to realize this today. Sin is an action. Now, let me help you. I know we look down on people when they have public sin, right? And we tell them, I can't believe you did that. I cannot believe that you found yourself mixed up in that. Let me tell you something. The only reason why nobody can say it about you is because it was in your thoughts and not in your action. But guess what? Action is physical. Action is mental. You can sin and never say a word. Understand that. So just because we cannot see it don't mean that you have not sinned. Sin is in action whether it's by word, by thought, by deed. Sin can be done in, in many different aspects of how you live life. Just because we don't see it don't mean it's not there. So here it is. I need us to realize that sin then is distinct from a ethical lapse or a moral transgression. Why do you say that, Jeremy? Because ethical and moral standards sometimes depend on cultural norms. But understand, when it comes to sin, it has nothing to do with cultural norms, but it has everything to do with the standard of God. And God has a standard for creation. And because God has a standard for creation, it's not dependent upon culture. It's not dependent upon anything that society has to offer, but it's all dependent upon who God is and what God expects. No, this isn't one of those sermons that you just get happy about, I know. But let me tell you, I realize that the more that we normalize this subject, the more that we can appreciate where God has brought us from. Because if we, can rem if we can recall where we've been, we can have a greater appreciation for where we are. If we can remember where we were, when we come up against people who are in the same predicament that we were in, instead of looking down at them for where they are, we can give them hope by showing them who we are now. That's, what's, that's what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about helping each other move forward. And sometimes it's good 
that God has forgiven, it's good that God has forgot, but sometimes it's good for us to remember so that we can help somebody along the way who have found themselves in the same predicament that we've been in. So think about it. Think about this. And I wish I had time to deal with this. I'm just going to throw this out there. Maybe I'll deal with it in a couple weeks. A person's sinfulness actually depends upon his or her spiritual relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's not to suggest that sin ain't sin. It's to suggest that where they are in their walk, where they are, determines it, what, what their sin looks like. And I wish I had time to deal with that. But here's the overlapping idea. Where sin is, God is not. Does that make sense? Where sin is, God cannot be there. So that's why we needed Jesus to come, to live, to die, to be that perfected sacrifice so that you and I could, when we stand before God, we have an opportunity to look perfect even when we're not perfect because the blood is what makes us perfect. So, so I, I, I began to wonder, you know, how do we tackle this? How do we not normalize it, but how do we make it to where we're honest about it? And it brought me to a, 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 the idea of what they do at AA meetings. And if you are a first timer at an AA meeting, they would tell you to say your name and say your addiction. And so it would say, it goes something like, Hi, my name is Jeremy Gills, and I am a sinner. And they would say, hi, Jeremy. Nice to meet you. And I wonder the reason why sin is, is so tolerated is if maybe it's because as a people, we just refuse to acknowledge it. Is it possible then that the reason that sin is so common in the world is because people are in denial about it? But then it, it brings me to that other place too where I ask myself, is it possible that sin is so pervasive in the church is, is that the church members are in denial about it? I wonder, and I ask myself these questions because of the fact that I wonder if we start talking about it more and if we start saying, hey, I've been there. Hey, I'm struggling with this. Hey, I'm not as perfect as I look. If maybe then we can deal with sin instead of denying that it exists. Because here's the thing. I hate to burst bubbles. I really do. But sin exists. I didn't burst anybody's bubble, right? Okay, I'm going to bust another one. Sin does exist in church. Oh, I just got 10 of y'all right there. Y'all, y'all thought, oh, nobody in church struggles with unholiness. Let me tell you, nobody in church un struggles with unrighteousness. Let me tell you something. Everybody struggles with it. It's a struggle of humanity because every single time that old nature keeps creeping back in again. And let me tell you, Satan knows what you like. Oh, we'll deal with this in a couple weeks. He knows what you like. He knows what your desire is. And so he has to fix that thing up in order to help you fall off the track. So here it is. The text in 1 John, as, I, as, as John is addressing it, there are three issues, one of which I'm going to deal with lightly, the other two I'm going to deal with heavily. Number one, the first issue is that they believe, the false teachers truly believe that no matter how I live, I have fellowship with God. That is the furthest thing from truth. You cannot live any type of way and still say, I have fellowship with God. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, 
the one I'm going to deal with today, is that they were saying that we are without sin. We're without sin. Now, wait a minute now. I think we all know that everybody has, in essence, they were trying to, in essence, what they were doing was, is they were invalidating the cross of Jesus as if it meant absolutely nothing. And to say that we are without sin is to suggest that Jesus died for no reason at all. And that would then nullify Scripture because Scripture says that he was without sin. And if he was without sin and we are without sin, then he died for no reason whatsoever. But I think we know that to not be true. But then the false teachers have the idea in their mind that, well, we just haven't sinned at all. Well, we'll get to that next week, I promise. Verse 8, here it is. He says, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So watch what he says now. If we say that we have no sin, I mean, I don't have it. I don't do anything wrong. My life is perfect. Everything I do, I do it for, I do it to God's glory, and I always walk in the way that he wants me to walk. I always talk in the way that he wants me to talk. I always think in the way that he wants me to think. John says, if you say you have no sin, you are only deceiving yourself. So let me tell you. There is, from verse 8, there is a difference between I have sinned and I live in sin. There's a difference. Here's the difference. I have sinned suggests that I am striving and I have missed the mark. That's where we want to be. We want to be, God, I have, but I'm trying really hard to get there. That's where we want to be. We want to get to that place where we can say, God, I hope you see my strive more than my miss. God, I, I pray that the blood of Jesus continues to cover me because, God, I'm trying really, really hard here. And, and when you try hard, you never got to tell God. You just show God. Because a lot of times we tell God more than we show God. We, we don't show God enough. We just tell him in our, in our daily prayer, God, I'm trying. But I want you to know that your heart and your words have to match. He says, I've, I have, I'm trying, but I've missed it. Here is the difference. I live in sin says that I live to a standard of my comfort. That's the difference. God, I'm trying to live to your standard. I live in sin says that God, I'm trying to live to a standard that makes me feel good about me. Can I, can I help you? It's time that as a church we stop picking and choosing what standard we going to follow. At some point in time, we have to say, God, you are the standard. And if you are not the standard, then God, then you're saying, God, you're not the standard, but I am the standard. And that's the difference between the two. One of them says, God, I trust you. I just fell off the wagon. The other one says, God, I don't know about all that. I'm going to choose what I want to do. There's a difference. There's the difference. So here it is. Can I, can I, can I, I'm going to be vulnerable. Yes, even preachers sin. You ain't know that, did you? <laughs> oh, man, y'all didn't know that? Man, that is amazing. Look, we do. Can I, can I tell you something else? Even deacons do too. Oh, y'all didn't know that. One. Okay, here's the one that's really going to get you. The elders do too. <laughs> oh man, where y'all been? Oh, okay, anyway. Listen, everybody struggles with this. Everybody does. And that's why Jesus had to die. 
because humanity could not get over this sin issue. So can I deal with, can I deal with, um, let me, let me, I need, I need to deal with this real quick. Fellowship is key to this. Verse six, go back. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk, verse seven, in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. <clears throat> but you know what fellowship means there? Fellowship means that God, I'm trying to live holy and pure for you. That's what fellowship means there. So that means that I can't say that I have fellowship if I'm not trying to live a life that's pure and that's holy. So what are you saying, Jeremy? I'm saying to us today that in order to have fellowship with God, you have to try to the best of your ability as God has put it in you to live holy and pure for Almighty God. So watch this. To claim to belong to God, but live to the comfort of your standard is hypocritical. Think about it. It's not just, oh, you know, you go to church every Sunday. No, that's not what it is about. What you're saying is, is I claim that I belong to God, and yet I pick and choose how I'm going to follow God. That's hypocritical. Super hypocritical. And that's one of the reasons why, as a, ch as a church worldwide, we got to get better at this. If we belong to God, we have to, our life should look like we belong to God. It's not to suggest that you're not going to sin. That's not the suggestion. The suggestion is, is that if I say I belong to him, yes, I may falter, I may fall, but you ought not get comfortable when you fall. Get up. And that's one of the hardest parts about Christianity is that sometimes we get so used to being defeated that we decide I'm not going to get up. No, John says, get up. Keep going. When you fall, get up. Keep going. And you know who's there for us? We understand that God is there for us. But as a body kingdom of believers, we ought to be there for each other when we fall. That means that we have to have a relationship with each other to know when we fall in so that we can pick each other up. Okay, no, you fail. Okay. Instead of saying, you fail, how could you? Say, you fail, how can I help you back up again? That's what it should be about. So here it is. And here's our reality. Though Christians are cleansed from sin, as John has stated, Christians still sin. And the false teachers are, are simply suggesting that I refuse. This is, what there's, uh, this is what John is dealing with. He's saying that the false teachers are refusing to acknowledge sin. They're refusing to take sin seriously. It's a refusal. But John says, listen, everybody's going to do it. That's why Jesus came, because everybody struggles with it. But you ought not normalize it so to where you refuse to acknowledge it. Sin is still sin, and, and we have to acknowledge it when it happens. But we ought to acknowledge it in such a way where we give hope instead of giving damnation. Jesus died already. We can give hope. We can give hope. But let me tell you something. Because he died. Because Jesus died for our sin issue, past, present, future, you should have comfort and take something away with today that you can say, I understand what God has given me because of the natural that's in me. Here it is. Number one. I'm going to give you time to write this down too. 
Sin has absolutely no power over me. You can say that as a child of God. It has no power over me. It cannot do anything to me because Jesus has taken it away from me. But that doesn't suggest that because he's taken it away that you do what you won't do. No, that's not what that means. You say, why do you keep saying that over and over again? Because I don't want you to leave out of here saying, oh man, Jesus done did it for me. Now I can be who I want to be. I can be free. Yes, there's freedom in Jesus. Keep looking at God. Does that make sense? All right. All right, you got it written down. Here we go. Number two, because of Jesus, we have the power to say no to temptation. Y'all see that? I'm telling you, two weeks from now, So that we can build on top of each other. But listen, because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of the grave, because of the resurrection, because Jesus uh, took sin away, when temptation comes up, we have the power now to say no because we have received a gift from God that enables us to say no. What's the gift, Jeremy? The gift is God himself by means of the Holy Spirit. So that means that we have the power to say no. We can say no. You can walk out of here today saying, the next time I see temptation coming at me full force, I have power to say no because sin has no power over me. None whatsoever. Here's the third thing. The third thing is that though, huh, here it is, again, though Christians are cleansed from sin, Christians still sin, and this struggle between old and new nature will continue. But guess what? You have the power to say no. Can y'all say that with me? Everybody, just say no. You see how that sounds? And sometimes no is the answer. And you say, you know what? Ah, man, but I just, you know, yes, I don't like to let people down. Let me tell you something. All you got to do is say no to temptation and say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Say, I know I'm going to continue to struggle, but still say yes. To Jesus. So here, here's, uh, here's the Mason moment I'm going to leave you with. Here it is. Christians should be willing to admit our weakness to God rather than make excuses or even deny that we have a problem. You should run to God and say, God, I got a problem that you've already solved. First of all, thank you for solving my problem. But secondly, God, help me to fixate my eyes on you. Because listen, instead of running from God, when you fail, when you fall, when you falter, run to God. Because when you run to God, there are three things that happen when you run to God. You run to God for forgiveness. You run to God for cleansing. And you run to God for empowerment to say no. You see what happens when you run to God? When you run from God... You then, are, you then are saying, God, I don't know how to say no. I don't know how I'm going to ever say no. And when you run away from God, it actually gets harder to say no. But when you go to God and you can let God empower you and cleanse you and forgive you, you can say no to sin. 
say yes to Jesus. Let me tell you something. You're here today and you are, are not a child of God. You have the opportunity right now to say yes to the master. Right now. Stop telling God no and telling sin yes. And just do something vice versa. Say, God, yes, sin, no. No, I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. I can't be this person anymore. You say, well, is that just for people who don't have a relationship with God? Absolutely not. That's even for people who have relationship with God. It's time to start telling yourself no. Tell God yes. You, you've been putting trust in yourself for the last 20 years. Stop trusting you. It don't get you too far. Tell God yes and watch him take you further than you could ever imagine. But you got to say yes. You got to say yes. If you, if you stand in need of prayer, will you say yes? If you, if you need a relationship with Jesus, will you say yes? Our shepherds are coming now. Our shepherds are coming. They want to pray for you. They're ready to embrace you. They're ready to, our shepherds are coming and nobody's moving. Our shepherds are coming. Moving. No, there they go. All right. They're ready to embrace you as a church family. We're, we are ready to embrace you. Come on, Jack. We're ready to embrace you. God is ready to embrace you. Will you come? Will you come? Stand to your feet where you are. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. Will you come? Restore my spirit.